I, I wanted to kind of explore the idea of us setting our affections on him. There's so much that Jesus has to offer. There's so much of who Jesus is. And when, when you're in love, there are things you do that you would not normally do otherwise. That's one of the things about being in love. And so there's a text in Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, in verse 2, it says, set your affections on things which are above and not the things that are on the earth. And, and what, what I, it's not that if you talk about setting your affections, and your heart, your soul, and all of you is not into it. Setting your affections is pretty difficult. Interestingly enough, the Hebrew word that's written there for the word setting your, the word affection actually could also be translated the word mind. So the Bible is saying, hey, set your mind on things which are above. I, I like in this case how the, Hebrew, uh, the King James translated, set your affection on him. Because the reality is, is where your attention is, is where your affection will be. If you place your attention on something, your affection will be there. And, and so when, when I think of my affection, when I think of the affection that I have for the Lord, when I think of when I go to bed at night, especially like last night, I go to bed and I'm just singing that worship song that we, we sang this morning about um, prepare the way he's coming through, ready or not, our God is on the move. And I, I know five, ten minutes is going by and, and I've not fallen asleep as yet because I could feel my heart being awake, saying, ready or not, my God's on the move. We're going to see heaven on earth. And I'm seeing and I'm experiencing the fullness of God. And I think when you begin to experience that, and, and I know you have already, but I, I'm hoping today becomes an invitation for you to experience more of who he is, more of the fullness of God, and that your affection to him would be that of like a laid down lover. And, and so I purposely went ahead and I went online and I grabbed two of the photos of people that are within our local church. And so if you're married, well, if you're happily married, if um, I want you to think about this day, and I, if you're not happily married, think about this the day that you got married. Picture your wedding pictures. P -p I know people here have uh, been divorced, they're like thinking, I don't want to think of one thing about my ex husband because he'd be crazy, right? So, if I, I get that, I get that, right? Don't ask me to think about my ex husband because he's a key crazy. Um, but there had to be a reason why you wore white, you walked down an aisle with someone. And then, so I have uh, Jose and Marisol. Jose's at work today. Marisol's here. Oh, I had a word for Marisol. Receive the word, receive the Catherine Kuhlman's mantle. Thank you. I had that for her during the worship. I just forgot about it. Receive that. Receive what was in Catherine Kuhlman. Thank you, Jesus. And, and so that day, and you think about your wedding day, right? And if you're not married, think about like the day you love it, the day you found that ice cream was great. I mean, I, I don't know what to tell. <laughs> like the day you loved ice cream, I, I don't know. Or whatever your favorite thing is. And so so now tell me a little bit about how you felt. Looking at that picture, how, how do you, remind me how you felt that day. Very happy. Very happy, like in the oneness. Happy oneness with God, Reggie. How'd you feel that day, Reggie? I felt extremely happy, powerful, you know, 
Then I was pissed <laughs> because she was late, an hour and 15 minutes late. So I went through a roller coaster that day. <laughs> but overall, it ended well. Confirmation. It was a beginning of a wonderful journey that's still going. Well, we're kind of going to talk about that part too. Now, I'm going to ask Reggie. So, Reggie, you went on a roller coaster, and he used the word. It's okay if I use it. He used the P word in church. It's okay. He was upset. I, I, I won't use that in the Zoom audience, but you all heard the word, right? He wasn't very happy. We'll talk a little bit about that. Did that happiness, did that feeling take away your love for her? Absolutely not. So you mean to say that you could set your affection on something, they could make you unhappy, and you could still have an intense, very happy feeling for them? 100%. Which he's, he's talking about flesh and blood. He's actually talking about someone who's flesh and blood. Who made him so upset on the day of his wedding. Maybe he was thinking, maybe she's not coming. Maybe she stood up. It's been an hour. Oh, my God. I mean, it, what, oh, what, 10, 10 minutes gone. Okay. 20 minutes gone. Okay. 30 minutes gone. Probably, did, you have, did we have cell phones back then? I don't know what year this was. It's five years ago. Okay, so did you call the cell phone, like calling the sisters? Like, w did you start making calls? And like, <laughs> w w was there any sense of, okay, w was there any sense of fear? Well, actually, no. It was a peace. And knowing that something is, it probably just caught it. So imagine that. So, the, so he's there. He has peace in his heart. Something is maybe something just happened, but it's okay. And in the midst of all of that, he still he's like, you know what? In an hour and fifteen minutes, in thirty minutes, in whatever time, before the end of that day, I am going to be married to my bride. I'm not going to embarrass. You. What day was it? You guys know it. Okay, you said a different date. You guys said different dates today. Oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I got some big, that's big trouble. There. I'm not going to ask again. I just caused some real trouble there. <laughs> August 5th is your birthday. So it was right after your birthday. Oh, two days after your birthday. Okay, all right, so at least you know what day it was. That's, that's, that, that is so getting guys in trouble. Hey, when's your anniversary? Janelle saying in her defense it wasn't her. The point, of, the point of talking about that, and you think of your spouse, you think of there are things you would do for love. You'd wait. You'd wait the hour. And I'm pretty sure if she had if it was two hours, you would have waited. Right? Can I get a nod? Yes. He would have waited. Two hours he would have waited. Because there are things you do for love. There are things that you would do because you're in love. And what I'm trying to do is hopefully bring you into an invitation this morning. Where your love for Jesus far surpasses the love that you have for a person on this earth. Because it is in your love for Jesus is where you're able to love your spouse. When I love my God, I become a better lover to my wife. When I love my God, I'm able to love my son better. When I love my God, I'm able to be a better pastor in, in, in this community. And it's because we're setting our affection, we're setting our love on, on heaven. And, and so, so Jonel, you, you, it, it wasn't your fault. How were you feeling when you were late for it? Were you like, I want to go see my man? nervous i didn't realize that he was upset until afterwards but um it was just in the moment 
I know Reggie, but I know Reggie likes to be on time for everything. So, <laughs> but do, do, do you see that she was upset because she disappointed the lover? The, the upset was on her side. It, so Thelma said it this morning. If you have this picture of God where God is mad at you, you have the wrong picture of God. And, and so Janelle's there and she's upset. She's mad with herself because she's like, oh, I have disappointed the one that I love. And what? Ah, <laughs> oh, Jesus. The point of describing these stories is I, I want you to see the alignment of how this aligns even greater with heaven. The drunk Marisol, what was happening on that day? How, was your, how were you feeling that day? day was magical. It's feeling... I was married twice before. It's feeling like this is the one. And uh, I was feeling grateful for his commitment. A little bit too long for my patience. But, but I felt like what I, I felt like his commitment was so genuine that day. And before that wedding and, you know, the whole process of getting a wedding prepared, there was a lot of chaos, you know, things like that. The preparing and a lot of stuff that happens when you preparation. But that day I made a decision that I wasn't going to get distracted from the groom. I said, no, I, I'm, nothing's going to get me distracted because my first wedding had, I even forgot, I was so stressed out that I even forgot my flowers and I walked in up the aisle without my flowers. Second wedding, I'm like, I'm, I mean, his, when I married Jose, I was like, my eyes were so on him and my heart was so full. I was just so in love in that moment. So safe with him. That's what I felt. Come on. She decided to not be distracted by the room. Not be distracted by anything else, but just have her eyes focused on the groom. The Bible says, husbands love your wife as Christ loves the church. There's an analogy there. The way Christ loves us, we could see that analogy in our, in our own lives and in our marriages. And I think what happens sometimes is that we get distracted from the fullness of what God, who God is for us. And we, we get busy with this, we get busy with that. I mean, think about it. She, uh, she talked about on her first go around, she actually forgot the flowers. So I, 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 in my mind, I'm thinking you're walking on the... Like, wh wh what do you do? Like, you're holding your hands? Like, like, it's the one day of your life where it's like, you know, I've got to have something in my hand walking down, right? But imagine how distracted you could be with the things of God. And it's, it's my hope today that as you hear these stories of affection, that your affection for Jesus begins to increase. That the same way in which you have this feeling deep down inside of with your spouse, that you would have this feeling deep down inside for the Lord and what the Lord has for you. Um, the, the, the text that, uh, and I know the print is very small. It's in Matthew 26, verse 6 through 13. It says, and Jesus was in the house of Bethany, Simon the leper. And a woman came to him having an alabaster flask with very costly fragrant oil. And she poured it on his head and sat by the table. And when the disciples saw it. They were indignant, saying, why this waste? For the fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. 
But Jesus, but when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, why trouble you this woman? For she has done good work for me. For you, the poor you always have with you, with me, but with me you do not always have. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, and what this woman has done shall be told as a memorial to her. People do crazy things for love. People do crazy things for love. And so as you begin to love the Lord, he's going to have, he's going to ask you to do some things that you will count in the crazy bucket. But a lot of people shaking their heads saying yes. But it's okay. It's okay. Because when you do it for love, you're doing it. When, it, when it's for love, it's, it's, it's different. When it's, when it's for love of him. Um, in that text, the Bible says that they were in the house of Simon the leper. If you know what a leper is, le lepers are people you kind of stay away from. Lepers are people that are quarantined, like, like real quarantine, right? People that are quarantined away. And you're not usually supposed to be hanging out with lepers, right? But when you're in love, you're willing to go to the lowest place. You're willing to go in uncomfortable environments. You're willing to go and feed through the pain. You're willing to be in whatever layer of uncomfortability because you're in love. I mean, think about if Reggie had just said, you know what? It, it's an hour and 14 minutes. I've waited enough. I'm out of here. He, as, as small as it may be, he made a decision to sit through the discomfort of thinking, what just happened? Did she leave me by the altar? Am I going to be on the news? Is it one of them things? The, the, the runaway, is this a runaway bride story all over again? Did I say something to upset her before today? But when you're in love, you, be, you walk through the uncomfortable. You walk through the things that you normally would have not wanted to walk through. You, you're, you say yes to the uncomfortable. Jesus. What are you willing to hear the Lord saying that's uncomfortable? See, do, doing, when, when your lover asks you to do something, it sometimes doesn't feel comfortable. But there is pleasure the other end. There is a sense of, of fulfillment at the end of it. Be uncomfortable with when the Lord asks you for something. Sure, if I want to do that. Because he, he will ask you for uncomfortable things. But it's not like when you it's not like when someone asks you to but this 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 sermon is like a runaway train in, in one sense. I'm not getting my words out properly, but what I do know is that Jesus felt it was okay to go within the house of Simon the leper. And he was able to sit there and listen and connect. Remember Mary and Martha? Talk about them all the time. Mary goes and Mary's doing the work of the Lord. 
And Mary's there ministering unto Jesus. And Martha is on the other side. And Martha is saying, hey, Mary, hey, Jesus, why don't you tell Martha to stop doing what she's doing, but have her come and help me out here? And Jesus talked to him and said, you know, you've chosen the better part. You've chosen to sit at the feet of Jesus. Now, I got to tell you, that, that, that scripture really bothers me. Uh, because I, I feel like part of me, I'm a Martha at heart. Right? If the, uh, I, I'm the one who probably says, you know, you, you Marys consider the feet of Jesus all you want. But if it wasn't for us Marthas, you wouldn't have any food to eat. <laughs> That's how I interpret that scripture sometimes. And, but I like how Bill Johnson says, he says, if the, the person who said that if the world would not survive without Marthas was probably a Martha. <laughs> but I'm willing to step through the uncomfortability of that text and say, okay, Jesus, I know I'm probably a Martha at heart, but what's the invitation you're making for me? What's the invitation you're putting for me to say, put this down and have that heart-to-heart -heart connection. You see, by saying what I'm saying today, I'm actually giving an opportunity for it. If, if, your, if your mind was already bent on something crazy and, and weird, you're going to be more crazy and weird about this, right? But my hope is, is that you will take what I'm describing and say, Lord, there is something there you have for me. And I will go follow after this thing. In that text with the Mary and Martha, it actually describes, Jesus said, but you, Martha, you're troubled with a lot of things, but Mary has this one thing. That's using the text. He says this one thing. And I tell you, when we figure out, when your heart gets connected to that one thing, all the other things just seem to get added to, to it, onto you. It's like, seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now I'm going to use a, a crude example of this. And anyone in the room under AJT? Okay. So, push through the uncomfortability so that you could have the glory on the other side. I remember when my wife and I got married, I'm not ashamed to say it because I want this for my son. My wife and I were both married. We were both married as virgins. Our wedding night, we pushed through the uncomfortability. I'm being honest and frank with you here. But at the end of the day, there was a glory on the other side. My point is, is that as uncomfortable as things may be, things we feel, things we experience. God is bringing you into that invitation. Like, God, I really was trying to get some sleep. You know I've got to go work tomorrow morning. But he's prodding you and he's saying, hey, I want to show you something. I've got a word for you. I've got something to describe to you. Will you be willing to say, okay, Lord, let, let me in. Let me I want to hear what your voice is saying. I want to hear what you say. There's something else. The lady in that text that we read earlier poured a costly fragrance upon the Lord. As you're beginning to explore more of who God is, there is a it, it will cost you something. Now, here's what it will not cost you. And I think it's important to describe that part. You're not going to get to the things of God through performance. You're not going to experience the fullness of God with a performance mindset. Because oftentimes if I say, hey, the anointing is going to cost you. When you hear things like that, it's kind of reminiscent of a performance mindset. And I want to say, when you're in love, you just do it. 
when you're in love, there's no performance necessary. You're there and you're doing it because you're in love. You know that text in John 10, 10, where the Bible says, the thief cometh but for to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life. For, for many years, I've looked at that text, and if you still use that text to describe the thief as the devil, it's okay. But I want to give you a little more context on that particular scripture. Steal, kill, destroy are all functions of the devil. Nobody's going to dispute that. But if you read earlier in that text, it actually says that he, that Jesus says, I am the door, and he who comes via any other way is a thief and a robber right? I can't think of any reason why the devil will want to go through the door of Jesus. I, I, I don't think he's that brave. I don't think he's that dumb. Try to go through the door of Jesus. He's not there. But there is something else that feels like it has the ability to try to get you to Jesus outside of coming through Jesus himself. Because that scripture has talked about, um, we'll be talking about, it has salvation written in it. And I do believe that one of the contexts that you could use for that scripture is that that thief, that robber, is your performance, is performance. Because performance would always tell you, listen, we could get to Jesus. There's an easy way for us to get to Jesus. Do this. Pray, pray this much fast this much, do that this much. All of the things that you could do, and, and it's born out of discipline, it's born out of performance. But what I'm praying that it happens is that it's born out of your passion for Jesus. I don't, I don't have to ask my wife, hey, could you please love me today? It comes out of her passion for me. Can I tell you a, a, a story that will make everyone laugh besides Kayla? So, so m my wife loves me so much that yesterday, like Friday night, she calls my mother in Trinidad and she says, hey, there is this Trinidadian meal with rice and peas. Of course, an island meal must have rice and peas. I want to make this meal for Andre. I didn't really ask for a special meal. But she went ahead and she, we got all the ingredients, we got it going, and when, my wife is cooking this meal yesterday, and it is not going well. And it is going really bad. And she's, this is coming out bad, this is horrible, I'm feeling to take this entire pot and throw it in the trash. I mean, Kayla was livid with this meal. I mean, she's and she's on the verge of tears. And Aaron's like, Mommy, I'm not eating any of your food. I'm like, oh, Aaron, don't say that. Aaron's like, Mommy, I'm going to try your food, okay? Mommy, it's okay. We, we, we could, we, we'll try it. We'll try it. And he said, Mommy, it tastes like water. <laughs> and she's, Kayla's livid. So I call my mom and trust. said, Mom, Kayla's not having a good day. My mom is dead. It's, it's okay. Don't throw it away. Just cook it down some more. It just it got to get some boil down some more. And, but it, the color's wrong of it, and it's not looking the way it should look. And, and, and you should have seen how livid Kayla was. What do you think if that meal was to be cooked for dogs, she'd be as mad? Think if that meal was to be, what, was to be cooked for anyone else. What made her, I think, most upset about that was that she was trying to do something out of life. And so we're, we're sitting there, and, and it, it came out on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the best, like a 5, right, in terms of his taste buds. And I was very, very grateful for it. And, and I said, Kayla, you know, it, it's okay. We, it's, it's, edible. it's not like, oh, my God, I can't eat this. Well, Aaron said that, but I didn't say that. Right? Was that? And the, the thing about it is that if anybody's, everyone in this church who's been to any leadership meetings could attest that my wife is an absolutely amazing cook, right? 
So it probably played on her pride a little bit. Wait a second, there's a meal that I can't make. I'm a Greek woman and I can't make a meal. Like that probably played on her pride a little bit too, right? Like what's, what is this meal that has conquered the Greeks? A meal from Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> Yeah. And so we're, we're at the table and we're laughing together. I said, Kayla, this was made with love. She said, yeah, I think that's all that's in here. <laughs> but who does that? Who gets so impassioned about that? A person in love. I hope you're getting the point that I'm saying. It's about love. It's got to be about love. In the, in the text, the Bible says that the disciples were indignant. The word indignant um, it me means angry and upset. And, and so in, in this case, this was something the disciples should have not been upset about. But I want to say to you that, that sometimes you would hear a word from the Lord and you wouldn't always be like, whoa, come on, Jesus, this is a great word. Right? It, it's like, and I think I shared this before, um, th there was um, a, an old friend that had really wronged me really, really bad. Like really, really wronged me actually cost me thousands of dollars and probably kind of detoured my career about 10 years. It's like he really, really wronged me. And one day I was praying and he came to my mind. The Lord said to me, I want you to send him a note and release Mark 111 over him. Mark 111 is, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And I'm like, I ain't doing that. <laughs> I don't even know if he's a Christian anymore. I haven't talked to him in 15 years. I'm not releasing that word over him. Not me. Nah. -uh. <laughs> he owes me money, Jonel says. <laughs> I got on my phone, I reached out to him, and I released the word of the Lord to him. Because I do not want to disappoint my lover. So if my lover says, hey, this is what I need you to do, I need you to let him know that he's my son. He's my beloved. You know what was interesting was that his ex-wife, I reached out to her afterwards and say, hey, I just want to let you know I reached out to your ex-husband because the Lord did tell me to do such and such. She was like, I don't think that scripture applies to him. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that scripture was talking about Jesus. It wasn't talking about him. So I don't know. Well, God didn't tell you to, to release the word. God told me to release that word. And I release the word of the Lord to them. And so sometimes God will share something with you. He would release something. He would give you a word. And at first, it's going, Arr! but then you realize, I want to please my lover. I want to please. I want to have my affection on him. And so you go ahead and you release and you release what God has said um, for that individual. Well, uh, one time, um, I'll give you one more story. One time, Chris Valton, he was praying, and he said, Lord, I want, you, I want to learn to hear from you. I want you to speak to me. I want you to be, hear my voice. So he, the Lord said to him one morning, I'm going to give you a word. He's like, yes! The word of the Lord, he says, I want you to go to the local grocery store and pick up all the trash and put in the trash can. That's the word of the Lord. 
So he's like, ah, you know, like, I'm a, I've got running businesses. I've got things going on. What do you mean pick up trash at the side of trash can, side of the street? He goes out. He's like, okay, no problem. So he, he drives and he leaves. He passes by the, the grocery store. He goes home. It's time for dinner. The grocery store is about five minutes away from his house. It's time for dinner. He says, the Lord says to him just before they're about to pray for the meal, he says, this is what the Lord said to him. I'm not speaking to you because I've already asked you to do something. His family is sitting around the table. He says, guys, I'm going to be right back. Continue with dinner without me. He gets up. He goes and he picks up all the trash. Now think of this as a small town with 3,000 people. Promise you, you're going to see somebody you know at said grocery store. He puts all the trash in the trash can, packs it up, he, nice and clean, all set. He goes home that night. Next morning, he's like, Lord, I'm so love, in love with you. Thanks for um, allowing me to be a witness for you. Amen. Lord says, I'm going to speak to you again. Lord says to him, I'm ready. He says, I'm ready, Lord. So he's thinking he's getting a word for a president. It's going to be the, he says, I've obeyed the Lord in this one thing. For sure, God's going to give me, I'm moving to the top. It's, I'm heading to the big times. He says, I want you to go pick up all the trash on the block of freeway that is for our city. He's like, all the trash on the whole fruit. Yeah, the block that's our city. That was a Saturday morning. Typically in the shop, it's super, super busy on a Saturday morning. The first two hours of that Saturday morning, not a single person came in the shop. He says, to his, he says okay. He grabs one of the trucks. He told his employees, I'll be right back. I'll be gone for a while, I should say. He goes out. He starts picking up trash in the freeway. People are passing on the freeway. And they're saying, hey, Chris, you, what, what, what you doing? <laughs> oh, I'm just picking up trash. Okay. You want some help? No, no. I know better in his mind. I know better. God told me to do it. I'm pretty sure I'm not supposed to ask for help. He pick, then more people pass by. Chris, did you lose something? Let me help you find it. No, no, I didn't lose anything. I'm just here picking up trash. Well, he picked up trash for the rest of the day. And at the end of that, he went back and says, the Lord was just saying, I just want to see if you will obey me in the simplicity of my goodness. Can you obey the Lord when he asks you to do the small things? If the Lord has spoken to you about a relationship and he said, you should not be in that relationship, it's kind of hard to say, Lord, I want, show me the, the revelatory realms of heaven. That because, like, you haven't obeyed the simple things that he's given you. How is it going to be easy for you to obey? the much more complicated stuff. What I'm trying to take you to the, on the back side of this thing is that when you're in love, picking up trash inside the street is super easy. When you're in love, going to um, Publix or whatever grocery store and picking up all the trash and putting in there is super easy. These things become hard the voice of the Lord becomes difficult. The things of God become when, when your love meter is not there. And so what I'm encouraging you today is to connect your heart with heaven so that your love meter has gone so far off the charts that whatever the Lord says, your answer is a quick yes. It's a quick yes. 
It's like that picture of Marisol looking into the eyes of Jose on that, uh, that day, on their wedding day. And she was like, it was so perfect. It's that day when Reggie is smiling next to Jonelle. And at the end, they're like, oh, it's, everything is good now. And, it, it, and, and, and it's for, for whatever, your, whatever thing it is that reminds you of when you were so much in love that you'd do anything. What would you do for love? I want you to know I'll do it all for love. You know that song from the 90s? Tell me bad. Wow. So dated myself. Reggie must know that song. No, oh, Reggie's looking at me like I crazy too. You know that song? All right. Got one first. All right. Let, let, let's stand together. Do it for love. Do it for love. It might make you a little angry sometimes. It might cost you. But it's all for love. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. We love you, Lord. So I want you to think about that tough thing that the Lord asked you to do. Actually, it doesn't have to be a tough thing. It could be something really small but you've just put that thing off forever. Lord said, hey, I need you to do X, but you've, you've just put it off and put it off, procrastinated and procrastinated and procrastinated. It may be something relationally, maybe something at work, it may be something wherever. And you've procrastinated for that. And you don't understand why you've procrastinated so much with this thing the Lord has asked you to do. But now I want you, as you're thinking about that very difficult thing, or it could, it could be a small thing that's difficult or a big thing that's difficult. I want you to think about that thing. And now I want you to look into the eyes of Jesus as you're thinking about it. And look at it as Jesus is asking you, hey, would you do this for me? As difficult as it may be, Jesus is looking you in the eyes and saying, will you do this for me? I hope by you looking into the eyes of the Lord, you now are able to gain strength and courage and fortitude so that you could do the thing he's asked. It may be hard. It may be something you have to walk alone. It may be something that will require a team and you don't know where to start. Start somewhere. It might be in the areas of your destiny. It might be in the areas of your purpose. What's that little, little thing he's asked you? Is it to set aside some time to connect with him daily. What's that little thing he's asking? But somehow it feels difficult. 
and you realize that it could be years he's asking, asking you about this thing, and he's not beat you over the head with it. He's not saying shame on you because you've not done it. The Lord's not saying any of those things. All the Lord is doing is saying, I am inviting you into a connection and a relationship when we look eyeball to eyeball, you and the Lord looking eyeball to eyeball together. You're saying, yes, my father. Yes, my Lord. I am happy to do your will. See, this thing, this walk with the Lord cannot be done by a performance. It has to be done through the grace of the Son of God. And the, I hear the Lord saying, I believe in you. I believe that you could execute this task that I've given to you. And you might be saying, wow, it's such a small thing. And you're saying, I can't believe it's been years and I haven't done this thing. God's saying, I believe in you. And you're saying, man, why can't I get this thing done? Look into his eyes and watch him invite you into a moment so that you could actually do it. But then, yeah, some of us who have things that are really difficult, they're life-changing. They're, they're life-altering changes that really affects the way in which you live your life. And I'm not saying to go on the basis of presumption. I'm just saying to go on the basis of what you know in your love relationship with Jesus, what he said to you. I'm not asking you to live by principle here. I'm asking you to live by presence here. The principle might say, man, I should be doing X. But by presence, it might be, oh, stay a moment. What's that hard, difficult thing? Look into the eyes of Jesus and watch him bid you into relationship bid you to come. That's what happens as we set our affections. We're able to look into his eyes and we say, I'll do what my lover asked me. I will do what my beloved has asked. You, when you're at home, with your beloved, you're like, open this jar for me. Move this piano here. Do the love. Love compels us. Love perpetuates, pulls us into a place where we want to. Love changes it from have to into want to. Love changes your language from have to into want to. I want to please my wife. I want to please my son. I want to please the Lord. If you're still living in the realm of have to, you're seeing part of the boat. If you're still living in the realm of want, of have to, I am inviting you. The Lord Jesus himself is inviting you to move out from the realm of have to into the realm of want to. I want this. I think just that low mind shift moving from have to to want to completely change the outlook. That little mind shift. And the Lord is inviting you into this mind shift. Thank you.
Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. So I'm going to leave the altar open for the next couple of minutes. If you've got something that you want to, if you need prayer for anything, just tap on the prayer team members on their shoulder. They could sit down and drink some more. Just, if you need prayer, just come up here and a prayer team person will come up. They'll, if you see someone come up, you follow. Feel free to come up if you need prayer for anything. But I'm, in, I'm inviting you to become a lover. Servants get a lot of things done. Employees get a lot of things done. But friends do more than what employees do. I could ask people on my staff, you finished? Reconcile accounts. But I can't ask them to move. I could ask a friend, hey, could you help me move? I don't help you. But there are things that I could ask my lover, never ask my friends. Lovers always get more work done. That's why it knocks the performance thing out the boat, Dave. It's lovers will get more work done than servants work any day. why we need not be performance driven. 